Welcome, adventurers, to the first of what I hope will be very many Rambling Bard travelogues. This is my very first trip, so this is kind of playtesting how to do this. And I will warn you now that it's a little rough, it's a little amateur, there's some big gaps in it, and the most of what I got out of this trip were lessons on how to do it better in the future, at least as far as making content for you. So there's a lot of things that I didn't quite film for this format. However, if you'd like to see a day-to-day, play-by-play look into what this trip was like, I really encourage you to check out my TikTok, because as I went through this trip, I was able to record TikToks on the fly and kind of give insights into how my trip was going. Travelogues like this are inspired from a couple of different places, largely my love to travel. Uh, I both vacationed a lot with my parents as far as simple camping adventures across the American Southwest primarily. And then when I graduated from high school and left after my first semester of college, I found that I really enjoyed traveling with Renaissance festivals. Well, after a whole lot of life got in the way, in some in good ways and some in bad ways, I found myself wanting and able to travel again. In fact, doing trips like this is how I saw the Rambling Bard going in 2020, before everything happened. Now, this trip was filmed at the end of August and the beginning of September of 2021, and it was at a time where I was fully vaccinated, which I still am, of course. I was fully vaccinated, and the peak in COVID activity was actually very, very low. And especially out in a state like California, where everybody was taking a lot more measures, I found, than the red state of Oklahoma where I live, um, I felt a lot more safe to go on a trip like this one. I still followed every social distancing protocol that I could. I stayed with friends who had a separate guest room for me just in case, and I stayed masked every time I went in public. Another inspiration for this trip, and I cannot overstate this, is Noah Caldwell Gervais. He is here on YouTube, he does travelogues, he does video game reviews, and he is an amazing, amazing writer and storyteller and artisan and I just I love everything that he does and he was a huge inspiration into making travelogues out of my trips. Um, this was one of the rare instances that I got on camera of seeking claws. So Noah, if you're following this, thank you for giving me that idea, uh, introducing me to the concept of claws. And if you want to know what that is, just go check out his channels. Specifically, um, his Ode to the American Southwest. Those two tra uh, travelogues are particularly good. Uh, and if you're into the nerd culture version of it, check out his real life Fallout comparison video. Absolutely amazing, especially if you're a fan of Fallout. Now I've rambled here quite a bit in the introduction, just showing you some road footage. Um, the majority of what I did on this trip was doing the cosplay work, but I did have some thoughts, including this one. Suzax, sounds like a lich. Zuzax the Undying. <laughs> that I wanted to share with you. But I'm recording right now because I am smack dab in the middle of the New Mexican desert. And I don't know if you can hear that static. Not the rushing wind on my door. Sorry about that. I don't know if you can hear that static. But that is the sound of rain falling. To my knowledge, it's currently monsoon season, and the desert is remarkably green. Remarkably green. And I think that's why I'm enjoying myself a little bit more. <laughs> it's also cooler out. It's only 84 degrees out here right now. Let's see if I can show you some clouds. I'm the only person in the car and on the trip, so ultimately it doesn't matter if I take three days to meander across Arizona. I will not take that long. But if I want to stop and wander through every single tourist trap and every single Native American shopping center, to see the same things, aside from the handcrafted stuff, which is 
honestly what I'm stopping to look at is the differences in the handcraft and stuff. But to see the same things, otherwise, mass produced, at every single store. For one, those stores have specific stickers and pins. As a matter of fact, there's one pin that I got. I can't really see it in the sunlight at the moment, and it's very, very small. But I think the hat band that I'm going to make is going to be a hat band that is made to put pins on permanently. And then the hat band is on the hat. Uh, and the idea is to gradually add pins from different adventures. This one is taking place primarily along Route 66. All of my little stops and byways come off of the Mother Road. I-40. <laughs> Noah, if by chance you are watching this, first of all, I'm incredibly honored. Second of all, thank you for the inspiration, for talking about the American Southwest and the American West. I have a deeper appreciation for it now than I used to, and I'm only one day into my trip, not even a full 24 hours. And I'm not meandering like you, either. Because I have some purpose, I'm, I'm moving at a pretty good clip. It's only been 24 hours after all, and I have driven 840.5 miles. Not something you would normally do in Loretta. Understandable. My car is a third of the age <laughs> of Loretta. And at 20 years old, nearly 20 years old, this might be her last trip. I'm not sure. Anyway. I wanted to say thank you. I had some traumatic experiences when I lived in Arizona before that I'm just going to skip over. They're not important. They, they happened to me when I was younger than 23. I said, nobody likes you when you're 23. I was a fucking mess. And I chose to involve myself in a bunch of fucking messes. <laughs> and unfortunately, that all happened in the great state of Arizona, where I am now. In the suburbs of Phoenix. Queen Creek. I don't know if you can technically call that Phoenix or Phoenix suburb, because it's like 30 minutes from Phoenix proper. But Queen Creek is where I used to live. And work. And I hated it. I hated pretty much every waking moment that I lived in Arizona. Regardless of if I was happy or sad at home, I felt like the, the constant state of summer was driving me mad. And I'll be honest, I still could not live out here. Because I do remember, I have not forgotten, but I do remember how brutal the rest of the year is. Summer is hard, yes, and the dry heat makes a difference. As much as people joke about it, I'm born and raised in Texas. It's one of the, like, one of the most famously humid places. You gotta go to Atlanta for it to get worse. And I was in North Texas, so I didn't have it near as bad as, like, San Antonians or Houstonians. I like putting onions on the end of cities to sound like a weirdo. Anyway, um, but genuinely, Know, I'm used to choking when you go outside when it's 90 degrees because the air is thick with water vapor. And it makes a big difference in Arizona for it to be dry. But I'm also from North Texas, which is as close as you can get to Tornado Alley or to the heart of Tornado Alley while still being in Texas. So I'm used to thunderstorms. I'm used to spring storms that scare the shit out of everybody else in the nation. I'm used to thunderstorms in the summer that have light shows that can put every single Pink Floyd show to shame. When I lived in Arizona for a little over a year, I got none of that. Our monsoon season was so brief that year, I remember it raining twice the entire time I lived there. I'm sure it did more than that, but I remember it raining twice, and I love the rain. 
for all of the stereotypical reasons like they make fun of Phyllis for in the office. It's cozy. And maybe the universe is smiling on me and wants me to have a lighter opinion of the American Southwest because it has been cloudy and overcast and rain. it's monsoon season and it's a real monsoon season out here it seems they've been actually getting their storms Arizona's prettier than I used to give it credit for and so is New Mexico and I only drove down I-40 there's so much more of the states both of them someday I'll get out here and maybe stay with some Arizona friends or something like that really reforge the memories and find new and happy things, you know? I'm actually not sure if what I'm about to go do is allowed. I'm not going to mess with the train, obviously, but I'm going to try and cross by it. Walk by the tracks. Phone case? Okay. I think it's Indian paintbrush. the most wise to be doing this in flip-flops, but I've got what I've got, so. Long way that way. Long way that way. It'd probably be safer, more safe, to walk around the train. And if it's parked here, I'd be willing to bet there's a conductor or something. And now I'm too nervous. I want to climb under the train or over it, but I can't. So instead, I'm gonna walk down to the end. See what we see. Actually, I don't know how far that goes. Maybe we should drive down to the end. Let's drive down to the end. Now, I did drive down to the end, um, and I'll tell you kind of a spoiler. The light had already shifted for the photographs that I wanted to take. There were a lot more power lines in the way of the shot that I thought there would be. And I did not feel that it was worth the effort to get the results that I was going to get. So sometimes that's the result of quas, especially when you're making a travelogue, is you may follow your nose to try and find something neat and find squat or find a disappointing result. But you still get to enjoy the search. And sometimes you find a real nugget of something interesting. And then, especially in a travelogue, I get to share it with all of you. Looks like we are passing Meteor Crater right when they close. Catching a beautiful Arizona sunset. wasn't total chicken shit, I'd pull off the side of the road somewhere and take a picture of it. I'm afraid of um, lots of things. <laughs> In this particular instance, it's about uh, my car being hit while it's on the side of the road. My, you know, high-speed vehicle is not paying attention kind of thing. There are a lot of little moments like that. Moments where fear took over. And perhaps it was foolish of that fear to take over, whether it was fear for safety or fear for mental health, whatever it may be. I dealt with fear a lot on this trip. A lot more than I expected because I was going to so much more liberal a place and I feel confident that I can do these things because I've done things like this before when I was much younger and had much less in the way of a support system and resources. But time and life wears on you. And you begin to feel your age and your vulnerability as time goes on. As you can tell, I'm still trying to figure out what camera angles work best and which you know, wide or medium or narrow shots on the GoPro. 
And to be honest with you, for the next trip, I'm going to do everything through my phone because it was way easier than using three different cameras between the GoPro, my phone, and my Canon. Um, an iPhone, especially a modern iPhone, gets so much done nowadays, and I'm going to have a good mount and a good stabilizing uh, selfie stick to actually carry around my iPhone and get decent footage. Uh, I'm also going to clean my windshield more often. And driving at night isn't always that interesting, so I'm going to shorten some of these clips up. Um, but I do enjoy driving at night, especially if it's through somewhere I've already seen, um, because it's that much more peaceful, and that much more alone time with your thoughts. And I rather enjoy this long bout of being able to examine myself when I'm in a happy situation. So I encourage the taking of solo road trips. Be safe, carry self-defense items to the best of your ability, make sure that you're locking your doors at night, make sure that you are um, just being aware of your surroundings at all times. Uh, but I definitely encourage solo road trips just to explore. Okay, you had your turn signal on like you were going around, so don't fucking give me that shit. I need to turn left and go find a dark road where I can park on the side, get out of my car, look at the night sky. Highway rushing by behind me. So now, everything off. Goodness, it's dark. Let me get out, let my eyes adjust, and look at the night sky. I cannot believe I'm here right now. The fact that this has happened. It's, I'm, I'm actively sitting in it and I'm having trouble processing that this is real. This is wild. That's all I got right now. I just, I don't know if this will fit anywhere in the episode. GoFundMe does not give a good way to do it with... Nobody cares about the reward. I've offered rewards. Nobody cares. Nobody's nobody's cashing in on those. It's literally just out of the kindness of their hearts. Thank you. I'm not even... I, I just got here. I, I slept like a baby in my friend's guest room, which, again, out of the kindness of their heart, they're refusing to take money, which has given me so much more to be able to do on this trip. My cosplay got more refined because of it. <laughs> there's just, there's so much, there's so much potential and I really hope this is literally the morning after I arrived. So I haven't shaved, I haven't gotten ready, nothing. I really hope I made y'all proud with this. I promise I'm gonna work real hard. Do as much as I can. Thank you. Now I went inside, I showered and I shaved, and I got dressed. And then I proceeded to have a bit of a panic attack, which is depicted here in the form of a TikTok that I wanted to share with the world as a way to show the hard parts of transitioning, the private moments most other people don't see. So that way trans people that see it know they're not alone. People who don't or aren't ready to come out yet 
No, they're not alone. And so that people who have no idea what our experience is like can finally have some idea, even if it's just a small glimpse into a kind of difficult afternoon. So with that in mind, trigger warning, anxiety attack, dealing with gender issues. Um, but thank you for all of the support that sharing this brought about, because this TikTok went viral. My first time going out in femme presenting clothes was uneventful, which is a good thing. That's, that's a happy occasion. I really didn't even want to be perceived. I just wanted to go out, get gasoline, get a burrito and some coffee, and go back home. And I was successful. And it was a beautiful morning. And I didn't have any problems. Nobody gave me any issues. It was as it should be. Just a normal morning going out to get breakfast. But it meant so much to me. And I did not feel I could do it, and still do not feel I can do it, in my hometown. I would love to see change nationwide. To have more acceptance of trans people. So, no more tears. Let's show you the yummy burrito I got. <laughs> Try and be quick here. Went on my first femme outing today. And I documented the whole thing through TikTok. TikTok is a lot easier for me to drop snippets. It's a lot easier for my ADHD. And to be honest with you, it's working for the platform. It's the platform where I have the biggest following. Here on YouTube, I don't have much of a following. I'm grateful for each and every one of you. And like I said earlier, I'm not really interested in becoming a YouTuber per se. I don't, that's not what I'm after. I just want to make art and YouTube happens to be a convenient place to put my long form stuff. Um, so if it's only for me and the 235 or 250 or so people that subscribe, then that's fine, that works for me. I have over 13,000 people following me on TikTok now, which blows my mind. Um, so I bring all of that up to say, there's a lot more to TikTok than just us doing silly dances and getting in cosplay and making jokes with different audios and stuff like that. There are a lot of people who actually share their life and talk about stories and talk about what they do for work. I highly encourage you to check out the app. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's not a time waster. It's a great way to connect and build communities um, and to spread information and to, to spread joy and that sort of thing. I, I cannot speak highly enough about the creators on TikTok. Um, the app itself has some problems. Uh, what social media app doesn't? Anyway, I'm off on a tangent here. I'm going to show you the unbitten half of my burrito that I got. So I went on my first femme outing today. Um, I don't have any makeup on because I was crying too much and then I realized I got to put on a mask anyway. I feel pretty good about this. Now, if you check my TikTok, you can see that I didn't feel too good about it beforehand. Because I don't look like how I want to look. I experienced zero negative things while I was out. They called me by my name. It was a good experience. So I went to a place called Farm Table Company. They were very kind, very nice. Everything there is like farm to market fresh. Um, and this is the breakfast burrito I got. Look at this. It's ridiculous. It's huge, first of all, and there's so much in it, and there's so much flavor. They serve it with a little bit of sour cream and what appears to be buffalo sauce, in my opinion. I think it is Frank's with a little bit of butter in it because it tastes like Frank's with butter in it. No shame. It's good. <laughs> you cannot argue with a good buffalo sauce. Now, I started on the other half of this thing. Like I said on TikTok, this thing is like Freebirds. Um, Freebirds level, or Chipotle is more common, I suppose, but Freebirds, Qdoba, those places with the massive burritos. I don't think I've ever seen a breakfast burrito this big. The other half is definitely gonna have to wait for like lunch or something.
fucking incredible. The potatoes are so fresh. I didn't think I'd ever notice freshness of potatoes. But God, when you bite into these, you really get it. There's a little bit of, it's hard to see. There's a little bit of pico in there too. Onion. I think it's pico because there's I'm definitely getting the cilantro now. I should note, because all of the COVID protocols are still in place, I can't dine in places like I would like to. I would love to. I'm feeling confident enough now. I would have loved to stay in that coffee shop and eat. And they even allowed it. But there were other people and I wasn't comfortable with it. So I moved on. And I'm just sitting in my car instead of actually like at a table at my friend's house where I'm staying because I can't park on the street where I'm staying right now because they're getting ready to do street cleaning. So I have to wait for that time period to pass so it's legal for me to park on the street and I won't get towed again. And I was like, well, rather than walk around the corner with all of this and haul it into the house and blah, 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 I'm just like, I'll just sit in my car. I'm comfortable sitting in my car. I've done everything else in my car so far. So if you don't like the setting, sorry. <laughs> I've barely even gotten half this fucking burrito down and I am so full. Because I don't normally eat in the mornings. All right, real fast, because I'm sitting at a red light. Uh, I am in Penn Nice, and I am going to drive now to Pasadena uh, to get lunch with my photographer. We're going to figure out exactly where we're going to go, what we're going to do, and what time, probably this evening, maybe another day. And my light is green, and I have to turn now and go back to GPS. So that's all I've got for you. Remember, adventures. Be safe while you're driving. So because the first time that I met KP, I didn't want to be shoving a camera in his face, I didn't even bother to ask, hey, would you be okay with being on film for this travelogue that I'm doing? Um, but this is yet another lesson that I learned um, to double check with the people that I'm meeting uh, that I would like to be guests on my travelogue. This was, this all happened so much faster than I had planned on, and so I didn't have near as much time to set up all of the meetings that I really wanted to have while I was in California. So anyway, we drove to Pasadena that day. It was about a halfway point between the two places we were staying. We met at a little cafe, had lunch, and decided we would go then to Santa Monica Pier down on the beach and take our first Van Richten photos. I didn't film any of that because we were really focused on just hanging out, having a good time, and getting the work done. When we were done, I drove home. And when I say home, I mean back to Jack and Maddie's house. And again, Jack, Maddie, I cannot thank you enough for letting me stay in your home and eat your food and swim in your pool. You gave me a safe place, a home base in California, and I felt welcome every second I was in that home. I owe y'all a lot, and my doors are always open to you. Thank you again, Jack and Maddie, for letting me stay in your home. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, and adventures, aside from the company and safety, this was probably my favorite part. And can you blame me? Of course not. Well, I went and got breakfast. So let's empty out the Mary Poppins bag here. I went to a lovely little place called Yum Yum Donuts. Whatever they are doing at Yum Yum Donuts with their coffee, it's perfect. I put way less sugar in it than I normally do, and they poured way less creamer into it than I normally put into it, but it was what there was room for, and it's perfect. So next we've got the apple fritter from Yum Yum Donuts. Absolutely gorgeous. Look at that. That's something else. It's lighter than any other apple fritter I've had before. That might be the best apple fritter I've ever had. 
So they have bagel sandwiches, and that was actually what I saw uh, on like Google reviews that caught my attention. <laughs> Watch this. I got their ham, egg, and cheese on an onion bagel. Stretchy, melty cheese. I watched him make it. This was not some reheated thing. This is fresh. Oh my god, that's good. I need another bite. I was overwhelmed by how good it was. Not sure what I get first. Okay, it's definitely the onion bagel. It's got poppy seeds on it, I think, too. But it's got this smoky quality. And I don't think it's the ham. I think it's the bagel. The ham has a little bit of it, too, though. It's really good deli ham. Egg is cooked to perfection. That is a fucking spot. And that was way more affordable than what I paid for breakfast yesterday. Now this time I'd actually had a little bit of forethought and remembered to ask KP if it was alright if I set up my camera on a tripod to film us doing our cosplay photo shoot so people could see what it's like. Now we didn't get to the park in time so we ended up taking pictures in the foliage outside the gated entrance, but there were plenty of plants and you I think will be amazed at the results that we pulled off. I am so very impressed with his skill level. So. Here's a little insight into what it's like to do a cosplay photo shoot, and if you'd like to see more, sign up for my Patreon for just a dollar a month where you can view the entire session at once, or just wait until episode two of the Rambling Bard Show. Yes. Let's do one. I'm gonna do a wide angle, but I want you to do right. Stand right there. Pointing at me. Uh, stand here. I'm gonna. I want. I want to be this man has to getting the right shot and when I say the right shot I mean it because yeah I'm gonna show you the shot that all of this led to if you want to see more I have an entire gallery of this work on my website theramblingbar.net under the cosplay tab and if you'd like to support an amazing photographer like KP check out his patreon patreon.com slash KP 11 studios So one thing I want to note about this trip, and probably a couple of the future trips that are not directly involved with earning money as opposed to spending money to create content like I did here with KP, um, I spent a lot of time at the place where I was invited to stay for free. The prices of things in California were much, much higher than I anticipated, from food to gasoline, and so my adventures while I was in Southern California were very very limited, but I have lots and lots of ideas for a big trip I'd like to take in the future that involves most of the West Coast and that beautiful, beautiful scenery that is the 101 going all the way up. Um, and I'd like to see all sorts of people the next time I go out too, and I'm going to plan better about that. Speaking of people, 
I did spend a little bit of time with Jack and Maddie while we were there, and Jack was so kind as to teach me all about mushrooms. And so that's what I'm going to include here because it was a big part of my trip. So get comfy, grab yourself a snack, maybe some mushrooms, and learn about how one grows mushrooms in their own home, direct from my buddy Jack, and uh, questions from me, and just kind of hanging out with them. So you kind of see what this is like, um, spending time with me and my friends. In the future, I'd like to do more like this, um, showcase my friends, their talents and their skills, and help them get the recognition, or at least give them a platform to speak from uh, whenever I can, because it's a lot of fun to do this. This is part of what I dreamed about doing as the Rambling Bard, not just showing what I'm passionate about, but showing what my friends and co-workers, I suppose, co-creators, everybody that I can possibly network with and get to know, showing what they're about and lifting them up to. So I hope you'll enjoy this section. Jack is a very dear friend of mine. I've known him since the Ren Fair days, and it kind of ties into how I'm getting back into life now, which includes Ren Fair and travel. So enjoy this little fun guy class from a couple of fun guys, even though I'm not a guy anymore. <laughs> okay, so have you ever said, uh, heard someone say, I don't like mushrooms, it's a textural thing. My wife. I would like to float the possibility that what might be more accurate is that person does not like Agaricus bisporus, the common button mushroom, also the portobello mushroom, also every other mushroom you can buy in stores, reasonably. Oyster too? Not, not Agaricus, not oyster. Oyster okay. is a different kind of mushroom, genuinely. Um, but most of them are just a kind of Agaricus bisporus mm -hmm. that is either picked at a different time or exposed to light or not. If you expose them to light, brown. Okay. If they're larger and portobellas, they're just older. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, it's just regular ass button mushroom. So, quick side aside, when you say older, I know a lot of mushrooms have like lifespans of yeah. hours. Is that just because they're out in the wild and things change so fast, or like? Is it is a button mushroom is an hour and a portobello is three or like the the actual thing the life the life form is mm -hmm. this right the, mushroom, the mycelium lives in there the, the, the mushroom, mushroom is the fruit is just something it throws up to reproduce okay um, so those will usually last less time mm -hmm. but one of the things that's important to remember both for people who believe they don't like the taste of mushrooms or the texture of mushrooms. Or when you're talking about, generally, mushrooms are like blank. Right. Both of those statements are pretty liable to be wrong. Because <laughs> it's kind of like saying, I don't like the texture of plants. Or right, animals, yeah. animals, because it is a kingdom. It's so vastly, yeah, there yeah. There are mushrooms that are crunchy. There are mushrooms that are sour. There are mushrooms that are spicy. There are mushrooms that are essentially like wood. Um... <laughs> Like, and everything in between. There's a sure. kind of mushroom called the candy cap mushroom, which tastes, honest to goodness, like if you had taken the sweetness, like if you just had the aroma of, like, cinnamon and uh, brown sugar. It's not sweet itself, but huh. if you mix it with sugar, it's sort of this very nice, like, mmm, this just smells like a pie. Interesting. Um, mm. There's, like, mushrooms taste like everything, and they look like everything, and they don't care about our rules. <laughs> he cannot kill me in any yeah. way that matters. It's yep. just that Agaricus bisporus was, for the vast majority of Western history, okay. the only mushroom that white people figured out how to grow. <laughs> like, <laughs> if you go other places, that's not the case. Like, they've been doing oysters in India forever. Sure. They've been doing everything in Japan and... and uh, it, that whole coast forever. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, but white field mushrooms were the first ones that were like big and marketable, and a lot of the Western growers didn't understand what was going wrong with every other kind of mushroom they tried tried to grow. Sure. So, yeah, essentially that's why you've only tasted the one kind. So I know it doesn't look like this, but this is enoki mushrooms. You may be familiar from with them from like nice ramen shops. Okay. They grow nice, nice and tall and stringy. Oh, yeah, okay. A good example of mushrooms not really giving a fuck about what you think they should look or taste or be like. Right. 
they don't grow like that in nature. The reason that they grow all tall and slender is because of where they're cultivated. They're cultivated inside of a bottle with a long, thin neck. And that <laughs> will contain a lot of um, carbon dioxide. Okay. And mushrooms, because all, all that mushrooms can sense is oxygen, moisture. And huh. they'll, they'll feel around until they find some, and then they'll throw up a cap. Okay. In nature, this will happen when they pop out of the ground or out of the side of a tree or wherever they're popping out of. Sure. Um, and enoki, in the wild, will form fairly regular clumps of mushrooms that you would think that is a normal mushroom. Right, yeah. doesn't um, have the crazy wisp stalk like in Skyrim uh, but, and such. But yeah. in, the, in, the, uh, in the bottle, because they're not sensing any oxygen, they'll keep growing stem until, until they, they poke get out the top, which is why you have those long noodly shaped uh, huh. uh, mushrooms. Do they use the noodly like the stems of the mush? I guess they would because yeah, you eat the stems all the time. Huh. Yeah, because it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's for that stem texture uh, that they're looking for. It doesn't really taste like that. Sure, that's fucking brilliant though. Like the idea of just it's you know it takes the grow a watermelon in a square box to a new level. <laughs> um, hey, so what I do is I take the green bags, I fill it with water uh, or well soaked oats. Okay. Very cheap. You can buy them from horse feed stores. Sure. They're a little harder to find in urban California, but I imagine other people won't have that problem. Yeah. Um, and then I throw them into a pressure cooker okay. for two hours at 15 psi. Uh, this will completely sterilize everything in here. Um, but yeah. still leave a viable food source for. The yeah. mycelium, correct? So, so yeah, grain provides an excellent starter food source for mushrooms. Cool. Um, once this is fully colonized, then you move it to uh, a fruiting block, which, uh, as you can see, like I have here, the other substrate. Uh -huh. So that's called the bulk substrate. Right. Um, which is, for this case, wood chips. Gotcha. Wood chips or straw or something. Uh, most wood-loving mushrooms, they require lignin and nitrogen, nitrogen, and okay. uh, a couple other things that you find in like grass, straw, paper, oyster mushrooms in particular will grow on anything. Oh, all right. Why are they so fucking expensive then? Because, uh, I don't know. All right, fair enough. Is <laughs> so rubbing alcohol, bag of sterilized, moistened grain. Moistened to a rather precise amount. It's absorbed about as much water as it's gonna get, and not a whole lot more. This bag is just like, right, right in front, front of the here. No, no, it's, it, it has a, um, here it has a, uh, filter, an air filter, so it can exchange gas, because mm -hmm. it's going to build up a lot of carbon dioxide, because right. it breathes just like us. Sure. Um, because it's not a plant. It's not, it's not a plant. Thank you. Anyway, um, and this is uh, micropore tape. This is one of the specific things, like if you're getting into mushrooms, um, and you want to do it cheaply, this is one of the more specific things. You still need to get, like, order online. It's not that expensive. Um, but what I would recommend is looking up the Uncle Ben Tech or following a YouTuber by the name of uh, 90 Minute Rice Mushrooms. <laughs> Just type in those phrases. You'll find the person in question. Right. Um, he does a great walkthrough of this particular tech is the term for mushroom growing method. Makes sense. Um, it is... Is that short for tech or techn uh, technique or technology? I don't know. It's spelled T-E-K and it is from the not scientific community, <laughs> shall we say. We the, let, let us say the amateur mushroom growing enthusiast community gotcha. has named them techs, okay. even though they're They'll grow any mushroom, any kind of mushroom that you can grow like this, they'll grow it. Right. Not 
any of the ones that needs like a tree or <laughs> like five trees or some of the crazy shit some mushrooms do but any of the saprotrophics um which means they they break down dead cells and don't exchange things with other um they don't have like symbiotic relationships or, or right. like uh you can grow any of those Right. So what I'm gonna do is I have here this liquid culture. It is of a heresium, Irenaeus, Irenaeus, um, lion's mane. This is a strain called lion's pride. It is from Mossy Creek Mushrooms. The last thing that I grew from it was fabulous. Uh, what was the last thing you grew from? It was uh, Old Road Oyster. Ooh. It is this one. Um, it it's really like a soft, delicious uh, mushroom. Don't let it go too long, or it'll develop a funky thing. Like harvest it early, but it produces these huge, like flowery ass clumps nice. that are just like super impressive to yeah. see. I love that. Like, Generally, like you can order, um, you can order mushroom strains from anywhere. Mm -hmm. But what I recommend is follow some farms, and uh, and if somebody is growing it for production, that means that strain tends to produce well. Okay. So it's always a good bet to get that kind. Sure. Um, there are other ways to acquire mushroom. Spore syringes, which we're not doing, that takes a bit longer because spores are how they actually breed. Okay. I'm just cloning. Gotcha. This is this is essentially the same cells that would be in the ground. Um, I'm just taking that and putting it in food, and as long as it has food, it will replicate, sure. and it'll all have the same genetics. If I was using spores, that would mate and produce things with different genetics. Okay. Yeah. So, so with I, it probably varies from mycelium to mycelium, but can some of them reproduce asexually, where it's like they, they are functionally supposed to split off and start a new... That is... Just every mushroom is a clone of itself, essentially, or...? Essentially, I, I cannot describe to you in a world where... Like, if, if your frame of reference for how things breed is sexual and asexual, right. I cannot describe mushrooms, mushrooms. to you. Okay, I don't understand how mushrooms breed. <laughs> no one else does either. <laughs> I don't understand like. less than like scientists do, sure. but they don't understand either. I think of every time when we talk about mushrooms, I think of that the famous Tumblr post that mm -hmm. spawned the you cannot come in any way that matters. The thing that I think back to is the professor's reaction to any time somebody in the class would ask them, you know, I cannot teach you about the mushrooms. I'm sorry. <laughs> like there's, there's whole classes for it. We can teach you. A lot of the answers are just roads unto the horizon. It's like not mental a path health. To a door. It's like mental health yeah. medicine. It's kind of a just we we kind of think this works. Oh. We're not sure why. Um, important. So, for liquid culture and a lot of other things, like you can buy grow bags if you want to buy grow bags. You don't have to. You can just buy Uncle Ben's rice. Uncle Ben's <laughs> instant rice. It's great. Um, but if you want to grow a grow bag, grow bag, uh, you can get what's called a uh, self healing injection port, which is what this is on this. That's cool. Um, but on this, it's just going to be like a slab of rubber. On this, it's stopper of rubber. Basically, you can puncture it as many times as it wants and it will close up after you are done. That's cool. Because it is like squishy. So, uh, what I'm going to do is in front of this as much as I can. So I'm going to get everything positioned in front of the, uh, the, the lavender flow hood. Lavender um, flow hood, that one. I never did learn how to do that with a butterfly. It is surprisingly simple if you don't try and do anything else <laughs> that with it. You just have to know, like, it opens like this, so it's always gonna. Right. It's on that side if the, the toggle is on this side. Yeah. yeah. You just get used to that so you never split your finger open the toe. Yeah. So, 
This is all sterile, completely hasn't been touched. Let me keep it in front of here. And this is where I kind of have to shut up because I need to pay attention, otherwise I'm going to like touch things somewhere else and touch this and ruin the whole thing. Yep. And which we do be. not want to do. Sorry if I get alcohol on you. And make sure when you're using still technique that everything you're going to use is within reach. And ideally you don't want to cross your hand over anything because then your nasty ass skin cells will drip onto the things and it won't be sterile anymore. Um, in fact, <laughs> this is not good to do all the time, but I made myself paranoid by thinking about it. So, uh, shake it up. cells of this that you get in here, the faster this will colonize for you. Sure. Uh, okay, so that was very important that I do that in a fluid, uh, swift motion, and also that I didn't open my mouth and breathe on it while it was happening. Hope I didn't. You'll know because it's on camera. <laughs> and then we, we squeeze, and we squeeze, and we squeeze. I'm just trying to get it over a nice big area. Having flashbacks to the last time I went to the dentist and it's what they felt like they were doing with the fucking needle. Well, they might have been. Yeah. I should have had this out beforehand. Oops. This is an absurdly useful item. It's a torch type lighter. Um, I use it for sterilizing things here, but it's also really nice if you have like a small tiny little spot of mold on an open grow bag. You can and kill it before it spreads. Because if it's in your grow room already, it's in your grow room already. But that's another story. Um, so I'm going to take this out. I'm going to withdraw it from the thing, and I'm going to immediately make sure that the whole thing is red hot. Why is that? Um, because that is sterile. Oh, so you don't put mushroom spores out into the wild when you dispose of the needle? No spores. We're not dealing with spores. Not this spores, is, sorry. This is the mycelium itself. It's the, the same cells that everything in the mushroom is made out of. Um, we take this. We open it into a fresh patch. We open it in a fresh patch in front of the fan. We open it in a fresh patch, face the fan. And then not sticking ourselves with a needle very carefully. We put it over there. Now this is going to act a lot like this filter. It's going to be open, but it's not going to allow anything inside. It was a good mix. Now put this over there. And Parisium takes forever to colonize, so forever from now, one day I will successfully grow fine things. This is my quest. So what is defining forever for me? Um, more than three months. For these to sit in that box and wait. Um, before they the, go this, into your... this specific strain, um, or rather the last time that I was dealing with Aresium, it took longer than the others. I should be keeping a better time with these things, but I wasn't. Um, but the Aresium just takes noticeably longer to colonize than like... If you're used to oyster, for instance, which will colonize in a day. Really? You'll like you'll look away and it'll just be oyster mushrooms being like <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Do what you like with me. <laughs> you cannot kill me in a way that matters. <laughs> but I can fuck you up. Huh? <laughs> uh, oyster mushrooms are very popular. I don't think they taste like a whole lot. They're really more of a textural thing. Okay. I've only ever tried cooking with dried ones. What they really shine at is um, for people who are vegetarian or vegan. Because they very... Replicate meat texture for Yeah, because essentially that's... They're not that far off from meat. Nice. They're closer to us than they are to plants. Heh. <laughs> they're not 
plants. Anyway, um, <laughs> or protists or any other sure. families. And then we're going to uh, paranoia sterilize this again because we're paranoid, and that's a broadly useful thing to be uh, when you're dealing with. It's a good reason for it too. We've been talking in front of it. Mm -hmm. Second verse, same as the first. Exactly. Then there's All of his bags are bound for the lines. Mm -hmm. I could do Pinocchio, but I'm just, I've, I've finally gotten a good strain of this. Yeah. And you do want to see that there are little floaties floating around in there, which there are a lot of. And the floaties are literally like that's in my ceiling, right? Mm -hmm. That's It's growing the same in here as there is in here, because this is a solution with uh, like 5% uh, sugar uh, of the, but not sucrose, of, of like a of a grain sugar. Okay. So this is like a dextrose solution. Now, is that something you make up yourself or you order it? Uh, yes. You okay. can do it with honey. You can do it with okay. like anything. Um, yeah. Would you judge your setup? Which we'll we'll look at the rest of it later. But would you judge your total setup evolved beyond a beginner setup? at this point? Because you've been doing this for a while. Yeah, a beginner setup, you would, these are like 400 bucks. Okay. Um, you can build them. It's a little finicky because you have to be able to do actual, I think actual calculus or like some other okay. kind of math that I didn't take uh, in order to, to calculate the size of the box you will need for the size and power of the, the blower you have. Sure, yeah. Um, but it's still going to run you like hundreds of money, sure. um, so what you yeah. usually will work with is a still air box or a glove box, gotcha, yeah. which is just basically a rubber box that you have cleaned the inside out of very, very well, and it's very, very clean, and no moving air is on the inside. This is just a little more sure. Like with a, a still air box, you're going to get contamination now and again, which is why it makes sense to use Uncle Ben bags rather than lots of like effort sure. stuff. So you can just spam because <laughs> one of them will work. Exactly. It's like ah, that one died. That um, one died. And Ooh, you'll get success. you'll get a sense for like what you're doing right, more or less. Time and dial it in. Um, whereas this, this is what you would have in the lab, only a lot smaller. Gotcha. Um, eventually, I want to get a, a still a, a laminar flow hood that's like this big. And Hold on, well, I, I, size. Uh, in about six months from now, come check out mushroom.com <laughs> for all of your mushroom growing needs. Um, uh, and we're going to be selling grow bags and that kind of stuff. Um, so we're going to have like a great big sterilizer and a great big flow hood and many, many still mason, mason jars for some reason because apparently that's just the best thing to do, man. Hell yeah. I, I suppose you could do it in a giant sterile vat, but how would you sterilize it? Sounds like a pain. Yeah, it does. Um, Spray it down with the ISO and let it evaporate. 99%. No, nope. that's sanitizing. Yeah, sterilizing is a whole other beast. It's a whole other thing. Yeah, you have to heat it up to a point where nothing survives. Um, it's the difference between 99.9% .9 and nothing and is important. Yeah. Especially when you're dealing with like bacteria and fungus because they've been at this whole being alive game a lot longer than us. <laughs> They are better at it. Which is surprising that we fail at it so often, at recreating what they're never at. It's like, it's surprising that they're 
that fungus is so hardy and long-lasting, and what I am, side note, convinced, that's what our planet's end goal is. That's our final evolutionary step. The mycelium takes over everything, and us, and that is the next step in evolution. That is why we cannot die in any way that matters, because the mycelium simply takes us. Who knows if our consciousness is in there? Maybe the mushrooms know. Hmm. <laughs> There's certain kinds of mushrooms that may have an opinion on that that they would love to share with you. Um, I will say no more. Uh, <laughs> I've seen interesting things where it was like two grow blocks of two different types of mushrooms. Well, maybe it was two different, two of the same type of mushrooms. It was two different grow blocks, and I want to say that they said it was it was not a clone of itself. I remember that. But they had those diodes that can turn all sorts of signals into sound mm -hmm. and they put it up next to both of them and they start they went from being like quiet to talking to each other mm -hmm. like whatever they were saying who knows but like they will communicate and converse and wow that gives me pause because like we have this right here on our own planet we don't understand it yet I just stuck the magnetic stir to the lid. Get plastic lids if you're doing grow a liquid liquid filter. Plastic lids. <laughs> Alright, Attic spray. amount of time, um, like, um, uh, a clone I have of a certain variety has, it colonizes really, really well. Oh. Um, it colonizes very, very fast, very, very well, takes maybe three weeks, three weeks colonized, then another three weeks in bulk, ready to go, in the fruiting conditions. But uh, heresium is used to colonizing like a dead log, so it's in no hurry. Sure, like, it's got a lot to work through. And it yeah, and it breaks down lignin very efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's as far as I was going to talk. Um, yeah, yeah. It does other things. I don't I don't know a whole lot about heresium because I've never cleared it before. Mm -hmm. um, I had one batch uh, that was like this, but. The liquid culture got contaminated, and the bags got contaminated, and they took forever to fruit, sure. and it was just, I didn't know what I was doing back then anyway. So, you're cultivating mushrooms that are almost, I, I would say the ones you're cultivating are 100% for just, like, consumption, for eating, right? Um, well, I've done Ganoderma, which is medicinal. Lion's mane is also considered medicinal, okay. although it is delicious. Huh. Um, I love that. There have been studies showing that lion's mane can aid in neurogenesis, the regrowing of neurons. Oh. Um, there are also other studies which are somewhat more disappointing. Um, it is delicious though and tastes like, has the texture of crab, so Ooh. it's good. No wonder you, you, you want to grow it so bad. Yeah, well it's just, it's cool. It, it doesn't look like any other mushrooms have grown. Sure. It's a big Fluffy ball. <laughs> Did you torch that? I don't remember seeing you torch that. Is that, you know what? Let's torch it. Two paranoia. <laughs> Double the paranoia. I'm sure 
is made for riveting television. That's watch what editing is for, my friend. Watch me repeat tasks in bad lighting. That's all right. Yeah, I wasn't, hey, I didn't bring too much. I didn't bring any of my lighting equipment with me. And I thought about it, too. I was like, the umbrellas would probably fit. Michelle's like, baby, don't. <laughs> Wise. Also, you can just open it for natural light. If you want to. Sure. I, I rather like this lighting, and I rather like the idea of, you know, this whole trip is I'm doing it on my iPhone. I'm doing it with um, a GoPro where needed. Um, for the most part, I've filmed everything so far just on my iPhone because I brought my camera more to practice photography and out of the box it came with a dead pixel. So the camera needs uh, repair. You don't mess with the hardcore thing. So I don't, I don't mind that it's that it doesn't look like a TV show. I want it to look like I'm a person and I these are my adventures and I'm bringing you along. Oh, Jesus, but fucking Christ, I haven't labeled any of these. You didn't label a single one, no. No. But I can help identify which ones you've done today. Yep. <laughs> Luckily, they're on the top. And yeah, they're, so they're all right there in that colonized. stack. But <laughs> This one didn't fuse. Fuse? Um, I have... Oh, well, my a sealer. This thing is a sealer, um, and so is this. These are for closing sandwich bags. Sure. And they're super useful for, like, when you're dumping some of the colonized grain into bags with some of the, like, wood shavings or whatever. Sure, yeah. Um, and so they're all kind of open all the time. Do you do the, the mixed kinds of substrate, basically? <laughs> for lack of, I guess that's a good word for it. Do you do the mixed kinds of substrate to get yeah. different results? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so like, say this mycelium in the grain will produce lion's mane if you put it in wood chips with something else. Um, what are, what it, what I'm doing right now is what's called the master's mix, mm -hmm. um, which is you can order it online really easily. It's it's kind of the the standard for wood loving mushrooms. Okay. They people have figured out that like oak shaving or oak pellets and um, soy hulls, I believe, huh. uh, are are the thing that produces the best results. Interesting. Yeah. People have dialed it in pretty close. Um, also, you can use straw pellets. Um, straw. Is that for any mushrooms? Uh, any any of the wood loving mushrooms mm -hmm. that are saprotrophic. Uh, the manure loving mushrooms. Honestly, they don't need manure. Sure, I would say, like, what, what, what is it in the manure that they're feeding off of, and is there something that works better? They like it that the lignin is broken down. Okay. They like it that it, it contains moisture. Sure. They like it that there's only certain bacteria in it, and that it is, it's not sterile, but the inside of it only has what you find in the cow's digestive system, which would be sterile enough which for consumption, for, us, which is yeah. what they're fine with, um, and nitrogen, which is what they're looking for. It's easier to consume the lignin, and it has nitrogen, and it's safe. So, e, I use cocoa corn uh, for manure-loving mushrooms, um, and lately, in this last batch, I've added. Um, wheat bran, like a little bit of wheat bran, right. just to beef up the nitrogen, because I'm able to, um, I'm able to sterilize really well, like I've gotten sterilized, di sterilization dialed in pretty, nice. pretty well, so I don't have to be that concerned about contamination. Um, for those of you who are trying this and you have not done it before, I would not add uh, bran, just cocoa core, turns out it's fine. All they really want is the moisture. Um, once they've consumed their their rice or their grain or whatever grain you have them started on, the only reason you're adding bulk substrate is so that they produce moisture and give them something to fruit through so that they'll, they'll have the cycle where they don't sense uh, oxygen and then they do sense oxygen, which tells them I should shoot up mushrooms now, huh. essentially. Um, 
they don't they don't get a whole lot from the whole woody stuff gotcha. from eating eating the the guar. That Uncle Ben took. Basically. Uncle Ben rice, the instant ready rice that you get in bags that is microwave in 90 seconds, is brown rice. You get the brown rice variety, not any other variety, just the plain brown rice, no flavors. They've already sterilized it and made it shelf stable for you. This is very good. All you need is the tape, you need the brown rice. You need a still air box, or even some place in your kitchen where walls are surrounding you and there is no draft, and you need syringes of some kind. Um, if you want to get into agar, you can. Um, but agar like agar agar or agar dishes, petri dishes. Oh, gotcha. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, which you're probably going to start out with spores for certain kinds of mushrooms and then you fruit those they're gonna fruit it's gonna be weird you'll get good ones and bad ones when you're ready to fruit look up a video on how to clone to agar it's very important take your biggest most beautiful mushroom that from the very first flush because that means it grows fast it grows big and it grows good Follow the steps for cloning the mushroom. Um, you will need like a full still air box for that part. Um, but after that, once you get your genetics in either your agar or your liquid culture, um, this is not as hugely important just because it's always contained in something. I'm just being more careful than I need to be because I'm practicing for like Bulk production. production. Yeah, yeah, not just for home. The reason that I've been as paranoid about uh, sterilizing the flame in between, which is important, is because we don't want to contaminate this, right. which is our our main stuff. So since you've been pulling a decent amount of solution out of there with each one of these, do you top it off with the solution um, that it grows in? Or? That, that, um, that would be hard to do sterile. So what Makes I would sense. do is I would just sterilize another thing of solution and transfer. Makes sense. Because it'll take care of the rest wants to grow. So are any of these things, I know this is, forgive me, thinking in the terms of plants, but are any of these things long living in the sense of like, like a fruit tree? So you have a grow bag, it's got established mycelium, will it keep growing fruit like indefinitely as no. long as it's taken care of? So there is a point of no return. It is, well. Or a no, diminishing returns, I should say. Okay, so. These genetics can be reproduced forever. From this. From this. Cool. You can keep solution and that, and that'll, that'll yeah, be forever as long as on the you, shelf. you give it more food to eat, it will keep spreading. Sure. And then every time you put it into one of these and put it in bullet substrate in a fruiting block, it will fruit from three to five times. Okay. Because that's how much is much food is in the fruiting block right for it to um, to fruit. and that patch of those genetics will um, as they as they run out of food and moisture or they are exposed to the elements in a growing room which is harder to maintain stability in right. um, they'll they'll degrade they won't senesce which is what you're talking about they won't grow old and die right um, but they will become more, uh, they'll run out of food and they'll, they'll be more easy to contaminate, basically. And I'm 
done. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing and teaching. Now, like I've said before, I've had several little adventures while I was in California. Lots of little moments and happy discoveries and trying new foods while I was there. And if you want to see all of those, I encourage you to check out my TikTok. But I do have one other thing to share with you here, aside from just footage from the trip home. And that was my tiny little day trip to Cantrip Candles Brick and Mortar Shop. Now, if you're in the TTRPG and nerd community, you know that Cantrip Candles makes just the most wonderful scented candles. You know they're famous, um, and you know they've been at this for a while, and what started off as a small venture in the business owner's home has now blossomed into a beautiful, huge operation, and I just wanted to share their uh, just incredibly beautiful storefront with you. Um, it felt like stepping back in time, but at the same time not. It just, it felt exactly as a Cantrip Candles shop should. So, can, Cantrip Candles shop should. That's, that's fun to say. Anyway, I hope you enjoy. After that, I packed my belongings, I hugged my friends goodbye, and I began the long drive home. And on that drive home, I thought about the lessons I'd learned on this trip. Lessons about fear, and about facing it, and the benefits that can come from that. I was terrified to go out that day, femme presenting as I was even in the bluest state in the nation, where I felt as safe as I was going to feel in this country. And in the end, that whole day ended up being one of the best days of my life. I got to go out femme presenting, and then I got to get dressed for work and shoot some of the coolest cosplay photos I've ever seen with one of the sweetest people I've ever met. KP, thank you for your hard work and dedication in helping my vision come to life. I also thought about the lessons of budget. It's a lot more expensive to travel across the country than it used to be. 
gas it's always good to over budget for but food too can be so costly that it can prevent you from going and seeing places like the Grand Canyon, which is one of the things I had hoped to do as a side venture on this little trip. But I have developed some new, let's say strategies for approaching future trips. I have a tendency to want to get to the place that I am going quickly and as expediently as possible. And that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for quaz and exploration. However, it does give me the time to note those places thoroughly that I took on my route out. And I can budget for more gas and time in order to see those things on the way back home. I look forward to bringing you much more professional and consistent travelogues with better audio, better composed music than just me noodling on my guitar, hey. and maybe even some actual writing instead of improvised voiceovers and scripts while driving along the road. My next trip will be a long-awaited honeymoon, and shortly after that, a trip to Florida, before my year of 2022 Renaissance Festival work begins. To each one of you that made this happen, from the bottom of my bardic heart, thank you so very, very much for funding what was the first of many trips and travels of this rambling bard in every sense of the word. I hope you'll join me for future trips, and I hope I've done you proud this time and will continue to do so in the future. Remember, adventurers, life is a series of choices between fear and love. Choose love. Always.